Hi, my name is Daryl Johnson and I'm an artist and pipeline manager for Quixels Megascans. I want to go over my process in using Megascans Atlas with i2's Forest Pack for my Quarry Pack eye candy scene. I also uploaded a full breakdown of my scene if you want to check it out. In this tutorial, I'll be working with Megascans Atlas to show you how to import, build, and use them with i2's Forest Pack in 3ds Max. I'm going to begin by importing our Atlas through our Megascans bridge. From here, I'm going to import a simple Atlas that I'm going to use in my scene. What I'm going to do is go to Scripts and Send to Redshift Atlas. My export option window will pop up. I'll select my format and resolution, use the source folder, and hit export. Let's go back to Max. The big difference between importing an asset in your Atlas is inside of Max, we're not going to get a piece of geometry. Instead, our Atlas is loaded as a material and ready to be applied to a plane. I'm just going to go ahead and create a simple plane from our standard primitives. There we go. I do want to make sure that it's square, so I hold control when I create this plane. Um, I should have just done this in front perspective, but let me go ahead and put this in 0, 0, 0. All set. I like to use 20 segments on all sides so that when I optimize my topology, I get an even flow of geometry. After that, I'm just going to add Edit Poly from the modifier list. From there, I'm going to apply the material I imported from the Atlas and Bridge. My next step, I'm going to begin to cut out my individual atlases. To do this, I need to visualize where my assets are. So I'm going to go ahead and roll out my maps. I'm going to go down to my opacity, load that up, and then I'm going to make that map visible in viewport. Now that those are visible, I know where they're all at and they're all individualized. So I'm going to change this and go into vertex mode. And from vertex mode, I'm gonna enable my cut tool. First, let me get into a perspective, which is a lot better, probably front view. Yep, there we go. Now from here, I'm gonna begin cutting. I'm not gonna worry about if I'm cutting on an edge. This doesn't quite matter, you'll see why in the next step. But while I am cutting, I will say, make sure there's a small bit of padding around the Atlas. And this is gonna help if you have a lower resolution texture and it's not as crisp. Let me cut out one more Atlas. And again, you don't have to be perfect as you can see. I'm being pretty sloppy here. You'll see why in the next step. Almost done, there we go. Now we're gonna go ahead and detach the assets, but first we wanna go ahead and disable the cut tool. And then we're going to go ahead and select the faces of each individual asset. This can be time consuming. I probably should have used the spray paint brush, but I'm just going to just do it old school, knock it out. And I know some of you are watching this and you guys can probably guess where I'm going with this. Almost done. There we go. I'm going to detach my selection. Personally, I name these very descriptive with letters because I'm going to have multiple variations inside of all my assets. So when I clone and search for the asset, it's a lot easier to find. Now that both of those are detached, let me go ahead and delete the excess. Now that the assets are their own objects, I'm going to reorganize the topology to make it a more even flow across the whole object. This is going to help in case I want to move, bend, or modify my assets with variations. To do this, I'm going to go to modify and add a subdivide modifier to my object. To get a cleaner flow topology, I'm going to lower the size down until I get a nice even amount of polys across our object. I don't need too high of a poly count, just enough so if I were to put a bend on it, I wouldn't have to worry about stretching. And that looks good. After that, I'm going to put an edit poly on top of it, collapse it down to one object. And I'm going to do the same to the next. I'm going to skip ahead for that. The other important thing since I'm using force pack is that my assets are oriented in the way that I want to scatter them. And also that my pivot is at the base of my object. So when it's scattered, it's scattered from that pivot. So we're going to go to hierarchy and we're going to affect pivot only. And from there, we're just going to move our pivot right to the base of our object. And that's it. 
make sure to unselect effect pivot only. This way you're not moving around your pivot. And now that our pivots are in place, when we scatter or add a modifier to it, it knows where the base is. My next step is to configure the shader for Redshift. The best way to stencil out your atlas in Redshift is to use a Redshift sprite node. I've tried using just a regular Redshift shader with just the opacity map, but I've actually gotten filtering and shadowing issues. And this Redshift sprite node seemed to resolve a lot of those issues. A dialog box is going to pop up. I'm going to want to keep my material as a submaterial. This is going to allow me to keep the shader that was imported from Bridge and just apply it to the sprite. Because I am using the Redshift Sprite node to drive my stencil, there's two things I need to take care of. I need to turn off the opacity inside the shader and also get the path of the map so that I can put it inside my stencil bitmap. Once the stencil is loaded, I'm going to get a boost from my render time when it comes to rendering these opacity maps versus the standard 3ds Max opacity method. If you're using another 3D package or renderer, you may want to look into an option like this if the opacity channel isn't working for you in your renderer because every renderer treats opacity maps differently. And with this done, the only thing to do now is to test out and make sure it looks good in your render. And we're all set. Excuse the uh, skipping around because I am editing this to make this a bit faster. Got a nice angle there, see what that looks like. Looks good. The next step is really important to working with these atlases and using a program like Forest Pack to scatter. I'm gonna create more variations out of these atlases so when I bring them into Forest Pack and it scatters, I'll have a more unique and customized look. Just to show a quick example, I'm gonna go ahead and clone two of these objects and show you how I use them to make variations. I didn't notice until now doing this voiceover for this tutorial that I actually get a message from my wife because she has comments for the written version of this tutorial. Moving on, because the way I name these, if you notice when I clone, it automatically sets it up to the next number. This really helps with organizing and like I said, searching for your objects when you're looking in force pack. For this first variation, I'm just gonna add a regular bend modifier. And if you notice, because I already have my pivot set to the base of the object, the bend already knows where to start. Whenever I add a bend modifier, I always get confused on which direction and angle and what uh, axis I'm supposed to use. So you may have to play around with it. But as soon as you get it, we're just going to add a slight bend to it. Maybe it's laying down, maybe the winds hit it. These variations allows us to get more mileage out of our atlases, giving us a more unique look inside of our forest pack. Don't be afraid to use other modifiers and different methods to get your variations. These are just a few quick ways to get some variations out of your models fast. For my next variations, I'm just going to rotate a few of my verts. Because this is dead grass, maybe, you know, the grass has been bent. Maybe the grass has been stepped on. So this is quick and easy. All right. Let me go ahead and rotate this. I'm just going to bend it. I know it looks like it's stretching. I'm just going to move it into place. Sometimes there's no real right way how to do something. If in your render that corner looks too extreme, you can always put a smooth modifier on it. The one thing I do like to do with all my variations, I actually leave all of my modifiers on my atlases. This way inside of force pack, when I update the model, it'll live update inside of my force pack. Let me skip ahead so we can do some test renders. What I'm checking in these renders, making sure that the shader, opacity, and shadows all looks correct. It all looks good. I previously set up the variations for these specific atlases already. So let me go ahead and cut on those layers and we could take a look at those. I have about three to five variations per asset. The one thing I would suggest after making all of these, save them and put them in your library for a future project. Archiving all these variations are gonna to add to your toolbox and ensure that you don't have to spend time doing this all over again. Now that all our prep work is done, let's dive into my quarry pack scene and open up forest pack. If you notice my plants and grass are all set up in a group, so it makes it easier for me to select into forest pack. To get right into it, 
I'm going to switch from standard primitive to my i2 software. I'm going to have Force Pack Pro. Once I click Force Pack Pro, I'm going to select the surface that I want my Force Pack to appear on. Be sure to switch to your Modify tab so you don't create any extra Force Pack nodes. By default, a card is loaded in that we can't delete until we load up some of our atlases. There's two ways to add geometry to Force Pack. You can add new item and change the custom object and select the item in the scene, or we can add from a list. Because I already have my naming set up and it's easy for me to find, I'm going to add from a list. I'm selecting different variations of the same grass so that I can get a more custom look. Once I have them added, I can delete that default card. Before I begin to custom tweak my force pack system, there are a few settings I like to cut on by default. First thing I do is turn off consolidate materials. The reason why is because I like to make custom shaders for some of my assets and I don't have to go into a multi-sub to change them. Next thing I do is go over to surfaces. If I have any extra geometry that I also want to scatter on within the same system, I can just add them right here. This works well when I want to use the same system and configuration for another piece of geometry without creating or instancing a force pack. Next, I'll head over to my transform rollout. By default, I always turn on rotation and scale. This is gonna add variation and randomization to all of our objects being scattered. I did wanna point out by default, mirroring is also off, but if you want another level of randomization, turning on horizontal mirroring will definitely help out your scene. I have it off in my scene because I actually have directional grass customly made. Next off is my display settings. I like to change from adaptive to point cloud. I like to nip this in the bud because if your scene becomes too heavy and it can't display all the visible geometry on screen, if you have point cloud, you can actually display a lot more using a lot less power, allowing you to move around in your viewport. Now that our settings are all set, let me close some of these out. We can start customizing and actually making our forest pack work for us. Under the geometries rollout, you see we have properties for each individual asset we have loaded inside a forest pack. Below the properties is the global scale. This is great because I can globally make my assets bigger if they come in too small, or I can individually go into the properties and make each asset bigger or smaller. My forest pack system looks pretty sparse. To change this, I'm going to go inside my distribution map rollout and lower my units value until I get a density that I like. I noticed that I made it too dense and I got a pop up like this telling me that I need to go ahead and change the way that my force pack is displayed. This happened because I'm scattering across the entire surface. There are a few ways to localize your scatter. For my scene, because it's a static camera, I found that painting in my grass gave me more control where I wanted my grass to be. To create a paint area, I go over to my areas rollout. And if you notice, by default, surface area is loaded in. This can't be deleted, but it can be turned off. All I have to do is add new paint area. And once I add new paint area, it's as easy as hitting my paintbrush and then just painting in my grass. Like I said, since my camera is static, I have so much more control where I want my grass to go. Now, if you have a bigger scene and you just need something more coverall, a more procedural look, then you could totally use something else like splines. Let me go over some of the brush tools really quick. Um, we have our regular paintbrush, which is what we just used. We have our erase, and we also have our brush options. We can go ahead and open up our brush options. Cool thing about this, we can change all of our brush settings, our fall offs, our brush size. Let me go ahead and close that out. Then we have our erase tool, it's pretty self-explanatory. We can erase with an erase brush. Um, if you notice, it's creating a spline and we have a convert to spline button. If I want another force pack to appear only where this force pack is appearing, I can actually use this spline, link it to the other force pack, and I'll be all set. Let me start to paint in a little bit more grass so we can see a little bit more area. There we go. All right. We're going to go ahead and up the density too, I think, because that's pretty sparse. Again, we're going to go to our distribution map and lower our units value. Now that we have more density, 
I can do a quick test render. I like to do these test renders early on so that I can see which one of my atlas are more obvious than the others. The reasoning for this is because by default, everything has a 100% probability. What this means is all my assets have an equal chance of being scattered. To fix this, I can go into the individual asset that sticks out and lower the probability to something like one or 2% so that it's less frequent and not as obvious that it's being scattered. Let me switch to my camera viewport so I can just show you how fast it is just to paint your forest pack systems around. This is also a valuable technique so that you can optimize your scene without painting in areas that aren't seen by the camera. Load up a brush and just start painting it in. This works really well when you're trying to paint layers or different species of plants. I'm able to just paint in or erase back some of the area that I want to reveal or I need more of. Don't be afraid to experiment with force pack. For example, I added extra paint areas to my one force pack to see what's working, what's not. Sometimes I combine them and get a new look. I'm noticing a lot of this grass is very tall. So instead of scaling it down, I can change the Z offset of all of my grass so that it appears to be shorter, but just coming out a little bit further from the surface. Once you get a good feel on how to apply and use force pack, there's gonna be a lot of tweaking involved to get the exact look that you want. I don't wanna go into full detail on how I got my exact look because we just don't have enough time, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. I recommend heading over to i2 software and looking into their documentation to find out what each one of these tools does. That's gonna give you a better understanding of how to use them to fit your needs. I wanna skip ahead because it took about 40 minutes of tweaking to get my thatched grass looking good. So let me show you the results of it. From here, I start creating more forest pack systems, layering dead grass underneath tall grass, adding dead tall grass to add more variation. All of this makes the scene feel more unique. To put it in perspective, I had almost 30 forest pack systems by the time I was finished. If you want to know more how I built this scene, I uploaded a breakdown video if you guys want to check it out. You guys can check out all the images I created with this scene in full 4K at my art station under D. Johnson Art. My name is Daryl Johnson. Thanks for joining me in this Mega Scan tutorial. I hope this helped.